many of you know may him or know him before uh, from different uh, 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 conferences he was one time uh, one of a uh, youth leader of the agfna while i work with him as a vice president and uh, he is working right now as a chaplain in a hospital as a dedicated pastor and a family man he is a pastor's kid his father will also come and minister among us later in another day they are originally from another church background but god filled them with the holy spirit his dad while he was uh, in another church uh, and uh, that is the reason that is the way god called him back to the and back to in the pentecostal ministry and afterwards after a long time of ministry with his father in detroit now they are working in different places his father is working in houston and he is right now working uh, among the indian people and others also are the members of his small church but it's a vibrant church i visited him in 2015 we have a good rapport tonight it is my privilege proudly present pastor alvin thomas to minister from the oracle from the lord thank you thank you thank you man of god thank you so much for providing me with this opportunity thank you sister for praying for me tonight i consider it a great joy a great honor to be with you um i am i'm truly blessed i am not a huge fan of zoom meetings and things like that i was very happy when finally our governor uh, lifted the restriction and we were able to gather back together at church let the people of god even though they're sitting a little separately i was happy when we were able to be together i think my biggest worry and concern is especially for young people young people i believe in the grace of god but i also believe that the children of god should have good disciplines good disciplines and just because we're going through a pandemic it is scary it is dangerous uh but with precautions and with trust and faith in god if the people of god gathers together how powerful it is how powerful it is so this evening the church spending time we're spending time together just sharing from the word of god and to hear and to learn from each other i consider it a great honor a great honor so i bless you and i thank you uh pastor for giving me this this time together pastor mentioned that i work as a, a hospice chaplain and uh, just like many of you today it was a busy day for me i visited over eight patients and spent time with them in their last moments of their life and uh, can i share this with you there are many times that i have spent at their bedside and they'll say chaplain i'm really sorry i was born baptist i was born catholic but i haven't been to church in many years i haven't been to church and i i tell them listen i'm not here to make you feel guilty or to judge you Uh, I'm not here to do that. I'm just here to be of support right now. And uh, I have watched so many, many times people that were raised in the church and then later on wandered away from God, wandered away from the people of God. I have watched their last days, their last moments, very difficult, very painful. There's so much wrestling in their hearts before they let go and pass. Whereas people of God, children of God. I am telling you it is glorious. I am a stranger. I'm a nobody. I'm not even related to them. But I'll walk in and I'll ask them, "Can I say a word of prayer with you? Can I sing a hymn with you?" And I walk into that room and I and I sing that song, "What a friend we have in Jesus." Or leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus. They don't even have strength, the ability to open up their mouth and sing with me. They don't even have the strength to open up their eyes. but what great joy what peace in their hearts moments after i sing my hymn and i walk out the door i will get a call from the nurse and says that patient has passed on and has gone to be with the lord so if there's any encouragement that i can give you right now is the right time for salvation right now is the right time to invest in your spiritual life the more you read the word of god the more you sing songs the pastor in the beginning of our our time of zoom he was just playing some youtube videos and we don't play these youtube videos as an addiction just to pass time but rather we play these songs and we read the word of god so that it is imprinted imprinted in our hearts because today i have the time the ability and the strength but tomorrow is not guaranteed for me tomorrow if i'm laying in bed 
and I don't have the ability to hear the word of God, if I don't have the ability to, to hear someone preaching to me, or I don't have the ability to raise my voice and to sing, I hope that there's somebody that will come, stand by my bedside and will sing for me. Let me feel heaven on earth. And let me feel the presence of God. So while I'm able to, I want to sing for others. While I'm able to, children, if you are listening to me, go find some opportunities and amities and go stand next to them and sing for them. Read the Bible, read the word of God, read Psalm 23 for them. Let it be a blessing for you. That's what the word says. Blessed are those who hear the word of God. Blessed are those who read the word of God. And so I want more blessing in my life. I want God to continue to allow me to be a blessing because I know this voice is not guaranteed for me for tomorrow. My abilities will not be there for me for tomorrow. But today, he has given me a voice. He has given me the strength. He has put me in my right mind. I don't have dementia. I don't have confusion. Today, this very second, I have. I want to use it for God's glory. Anyone that is willing to listen, I want to use it for God's glory and for God's honor. Let me uh, turn your attention to the word of God. The last time I spoke to you, I uh, spoke from Elijah. I'm done teaching from Elijah at our church. Uh, our church is a small church in, in uh, Utica, Michigan. Uh, it's a small church, but we are really enjoying the fire of God. Our services, we are really enjoying the fire of God. I am happy when I see children lingering in God's presence, shedding tears, hungering and thirsting for God. That's why the word of God says that uh, we are raising up an Elijah generation, a generation that knows how to call upon God. That's what our prayer and our desire is not just for our church, but for our nation, for the, for the ends of the world, to go, for God to raise up a remnant. But in the new year, God has turned my attention to teach from Hebrews. And uh, I want to warn you in advance, I, am, I, am, I don't consider myself a seasoned preacher. I'm going to share my, my beliefs, my, my, my beliefs with you. And there may be areas, may, you may have a question, you may have some doubts, you may not agree with me, I'm okay with that. Talk to your pastor and uh, say, you know, I don't fully agree with Pastor Alvin and uh, wrestle through this. It's good for us to study the word of God. It's good for us to study the word of God. But Hebrews chapter one, I'm going to read a few verses and we'll meditate together. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the Son, He created the universe. Let me just pause there for a moment. We know throughout Scripture, you have you have attended Sunday school, you've you've heard so many sermons. You know that our God likes to talk to us. He likes to talk to us throughout the Old Testament. He spoke through visions and dreams, through life experiences. God spoke. God spoke. And the prophets and prophetesses of old, they listened, they heard the voice of God. Now, if you ask me, you know, is it easy to hear the voice of God? Oftentimes, it's not a voice that you can hear, that you can record. Oftentimes, it's a feeling, a thought, an inkling that you get in your heart. And you act on that, that feeling, act on that voice. Now, let me share this with you. Many times in the Old Testament, these prophets... They heard the voice of God and they took a step of faith. For example, Abraham. Abraham, the Bible says, he heard the voice of God. And God was telling him, take your son, your beloved son, Isaac. And he did not share that with Sarah. But instead, he went ahead and obeyed the voice of God. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11, it was counted as righteousness to him. Righteousness is a big word. I don't know if there's any children that are listening to me right now. Righteousness simply means having a right relationship with God. Abraham, his actions, his actions, his actions. Jane says, your, your faith alone is not good enough. Faith plus works. Your actions shows if you have a right relationship with God. We live in a world where people says, God knows my heart. No one has the right to judge me. I agree with you to a certain extent, but the reality is, is that God looks at our actions. What is in your heart will be revealed through your actions. Your actions will tell me what you believe. Everybody has good intentions. 
That's why we have a judicial system, a court system. Because when you go to court, everyone will say, I didn't mean that. I had good intentions. But the judge doesn't ask you whether you had good intentions or not. The judge doesn't ask you if you meant that or not. The judge says, I'm going to judge you based on your actions. I'm going to judge you based on your actions. Abraham acted in a way that his faith was revealed. I think many of us, I think where we struggle with is we talk a good talk, but we our faith coming into action is where we really struggle with. This is a problem that everyone deals with, whether you're in the church or you're in the world. Don't think people in the world are better. They too are hypocrites. They too say the same thing. Not to talk about politics, but I think it's kind of funny for a moment. Our new president got into office. I think the whole nation is excited, they want to give him a chance. They want to believe, be hopeful, want to believe in good things. One of the first executive orders he wrote was, I want everyone to wear a mask on federal property. Everyone to wear a mask on federal property. I think that's a good idea. But this morning I woke up and there's a newspaper article that says he went to the Lincoln Memorial and he wasn't wearing a mask. And so journalists made fun of him. They said, you just yesterday, you had an executive order. You had an executive order. Today, you can't even follow your own orders. Listen, this is the world we live in. We struggle. We struggle to obey the voice of God. So we hear the voice of God. In the New Testament, the Bible says we hear the voice of God, but we're not like Abraham in the New Testament. In the New Testament, I hear the voice of God, and then I submit it to others. Pastor, I heard the voice of God, and this is what I'm sensing, what I'm feeling in my heart. John Bevere writes in his book, Thus Saith the Lord, test the spirit, test the spirit that you're hearing. Submit your, your ideas to others. The Bible says there's wisdom when you get counsel from others, two or three. So I especially encourage young people, especially whenever you hear the voice of God, whenever you feel, you sense the voice of God, submit it to the people around you. Submit it to the people around you. Right now, I'm counseling a, a, a person in our church, and uh, I asked them, what are you sensing? What are you feeling from God? So that person told me what they're sensing and they're feeling from God. The next question I asked them, what are the people around you saying? And so that person said, well, this person disagrees with me. 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 I said, okay, tell me how many people are believers, followers of Jesus have surrendered their life. That person said, not one single person that she submitted her thoughts to are followers of Christ. So when we hear the voice of God, we surrender our thoughts and our ideas to the body of Christ, to believers that we trust and say, Pastor, this is what I'm sensing from God. Do you have peace in your heart? Do you, can you give me some direction and clarity and guidance? So in the Old Testament, God spoke in many, many different ways. But there was also a 400-year period where God was silent. Between the time of Malachi and Matthew, there's a 400-year period where we don't hear any prophet, any man or woman of God, writing down and saying, I sensed from God. I heard the voice of God. I felt God's direction and guidance. If you study your history, you will find the Maccabees. They held on to their commitment to God, and they fought till their death even though they did not hear the voice of God. When you don't hear the voice of God, you hold on to your Bible and you say, God, I can't hear you right now. I can't feel you right now, but you have spoken in the past. I'm going to hold on to your word until I can hear from you. Many times I have a hard time hearing God right here, right now. God, what do I do in this situation? I don't know. When I don't know what to do, I hold on to what he has given to me. I thank God for the word of God, the Bible. The Bible is God's express voice to us today. As you read through the scripture, you understand that the Bible is saying, in the past, in the Old Testament, he gave us prophets. But now in this last days, he has given us his son, Jesus Christ. Now, mind you, I believe in the, in the New Testament, I believe God has given us apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. These are the fivefold offices that he has given to the body of Christ. 
We honor them. We respect them. We love them. But the Bible says in these last days, he has given us his son, Jesus. Can I tell you something? We should not put our trust or our hope in the voice of a pastor, an apostle, or a prophet greater than the voice of Jesus. I love you with all of my heart. I love you with all of my heart. I pray that as we're talking tonight, that you have a deeper love to hear the voice of Jesus. Jesus is no longer in the grave. He is no longer defeated. You know that. He is no longer defeated. He's no longer bound to that grave any longer. He has defeated death. He has defeated sin. He has defeated the grave. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's alive and he wants to talk to us today. My dear friend, my brother, my sister, he wants to talk to us today. Please don't allow a, a man of God, a woman of God, a preacher that you like, anyone or anything else to substitute for the voice of Jesus in your life. Recently, I was watching on social media. They were saying, please pray for your pastors. Please pray for your pastors. I, if I remember correctly, I've heard Pastor Stevenson saying the same thing. In 2020, it was a year of devastation for the body of Christ. Not only did we deal with a pandemic, not only did we see the church shutting down so that people cannot even attend services and hear their pre pastors preach, but 2020 was a year where numerous mega church pastors committed suicide, took their life. Can you imagine the devastation their families and their churches felt because they were mega church pastors? And recently, a journalist wrote down about 20 different scandals in the body of Christ, my dear friend, with great humility, with great humility. The Bible says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I'm not there yet, my friends. I'm not there yet where I can say, like the Apostle Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. But none of us, none of us are able to stand firm but by the grace of God. None of us are able to stand firm but by the prayer support of your brothers and sisters. You need the prayer support of one another, especially men and women of God that are preaching, that are preaching and teaching, that are standing on their knees at their bedside, praying for you. They cannot pray for you. They cannot stand in the gap and pray for you unless you support them in prayer. So can I just share this? More than seeing your pastor, your apostle, your prophet, your teacher as, a, as the voice of God for you, can you just link arms with them? and partner with them and pray for them. Call them up after this meeting tonight and say, Pastor, I thank God for you. I thank God that you have a word from God every time you open up your mouth. Thank God that you have wisdom to share with me. But Pastor, I just want to pray for you. I know that you get discouraged. I know that you get lonely. You're always praying for everybody else. But nobody prays for you. I actually had a sister in my church that recently came to my house and she's always asking me to pray for her. She said, Pastor, can you just pause for a moment? Her family stood around me. She said, Pastor, can you pause for a moment? She said, you always pray for us. Can I pray for you? When I heard that sister praying for us, for me, for my family, I had tears in my eyes because very rarely do people pray for their pastors, their teachers. And they always want people to pray for them. They say, Pastor, you pray so well. You pray so eloquently. But very rarely do you see anyone saying, Pastor, I'm thinking about you. Pastor's wife, I'm thinking about you. I'm praying for you. Can I just pray for you right here, right now? We do that as pastors. We do that all the time. When someone asks me to pray for them, I says, give me your hand right now. We're going to pray right this very second. I'm not going to promise that I'm going to pray for you one hour from now. I'm not going to promise that I'm going to pray for you tonight. I'm going to pray for you right here, right now. In the past, God spoke to us in many different ways. But today, in the last days, God is speaking to us through his son, Jesus Christ. What I love about Hebrews is that it's not a letter like you are familiar with. It's not a dear so-and-so. Let me share this letter with you. Let me share some advice to this church. No. What you find interesting about Hebrews, the way the writer has written it, it's as if God is speaking to us. It's like a sermon. Hebrews is a sermon that was preached on Sunday. 
And this is what, what God is saying to us. Listen, Jesus, I sent him down to this earth. I had an assignment for him. Now the Jewish believers are having a hard time holding on to Jesus. When persecution, when trials come, they want to say, oh, I want to let go of Jesus and I want to be a good Jew. Listen, this is the same struggle we're going through. There's a, a cultural tie. There's a pull for us. Sometimes I want to be Indian. Sometimes I want to be Christian. Sometimes I want to be American. Sometimes I want to be a Pentecostal. The same pull that the believers that Hebrews was being written to is the same pull we're feeling too. Sometimes I want to be American. Sometimes I want to be a Christian. Can I share from the word of God? The word is telling us, God is speaking to us and saying, Jesus came down to this earth, not to just be your friend, not to just be a miracle worker, a wonder worker for us, not just to heal blind eyes or to heal lepers. I sent my son, Jesus, to this earth to be your savior. He is greater than the angels. I have sent him to be your savior. Isn't this amazing how God is speaking to us? He speaks to us. Now, there's five things I want to quickly just share with you, and then we'll wrap up. He has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance, as an inheritance. It's a great word right there. Think about this with me for a moment. God created each and every one of us in the image of God. The Bible says we were formed in our mother's womb. He knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. He knew our name. He knew us so well. God created us in his image. He started this world off perfectly, perfectly. We are his children. The Bible says that he created us to have communion, fellowship with us. Think about that for a moment. We are here today. We are just dust. But yet God created us to be friends with him, to have communion and fellowship with him. We were his children. We were his inheritance. But the one moment we allowed sin to enter our life, we broke that relationship with God. That inheritance was lost from God forever. It was lost whom he created for his own pleasure, for his own desire, whom God created. He lost out of his own hands. Think about this for a moment. Many of us are parents. If we lose something, won't we get angry and upset? Won't we react very strongly? Won't it frustrate us and make us sad and depressed? Can you imagine the heart of the father when he lost in his inheritance in the Garden of Eden? Then throughout the Old Testament, we see, this is my imagination, I see, we see throughout the Old Testament that God is secretly coming into this earth. And revealing himself to us secretly. The three that came and visited Abraham outside of his tent. Secretly he has to come into this world. Because we had banished God. We didn't want a relationship with God. But I thank God in the fullness of time. In the brilliance of God. He said that even though you banish me. I am strong. I am powerful. I will come back into this earth that you banished me from. Even though you turned your back on me, I'm going to come after you. I'm going to force myself into your life. He came after me. The children sing it like this. God chased after me in the fullness of time. Oh, this is making me so excited. Romans 3.23 says, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Jesus came on the cross of Calvary and he died for my sins. While I didn't even know better, while I was lost in my sin, while I was lost in my pit, he stood on that cross and he said, Father, forgive Alvin because he doesn't know what he's doing. You see, I've heard some preachers say it like this. Salvation has been given to every single human. It's been given to them freely. Every single human being is saved. They just don't know it. I don't know how, what you believe. But to a certain extent, I agree with that. Every single human being, I don't know, 6 billion, 8 billion people on the face of this earth today, they are saved. They're saved by the blood of Jesus. They just don't know it. The darkness of this world has blinded their eyes. The darkness of this world has made their ears deaf. 
So they're not able to understand that salvation has been won for them. They have received their salvation. If they'll only respond, salvation is theirs. If they'll only respond, salvation is theirs. Last Sunday, a, a, a child in our church came to me and said, Pastor, I have a transgender friend. How do I share the gospel with them? And I had to explain to him, Samuel, you don't need to try to bring that person to salvation. You know, continue to love that person and tell them, listen, I love you. I may not understand your lifestyle, but I love you. And I know Jesus loves you. Whenever you get an opportunity, you don't need to force Jesus down their throat, but you can remind them, Jesus still loves you. He knows how you were created. He knows the struggles that you're going through. So the Bible is saying that Jesus came, well, we became his inheritance. You may not even realize this, but you belong to Jesus, my friend. You're his inheritance. You're a gift back to God. And once we realize this, you open your eyes up and you live your life every day. You are a gift back to Jesus. You are his inheritance. You belong back to him. And through the son, he created the universe the universe another way that that word is translated universe is ages we are going through different ages different ages in our life right now we just finished one administration in america a new administration has started don't think that god doesn't know about all this god knows about all this he created the different ages he knows he knows what's happening the sun radiates god's own glory and expresses the very character of God. Sometimes we read that section and we think, so he's reflecting the glory of God. He's reflecting the Father. No, Jesus has his own radiance, light. They are one. Jesus is not uh, less than. He doesn't need to reflect the Father. He has his own light that is revealing in our life. This is how I comfort myself many times when I struggle. Every good thing in our life, it is a reflection of God's goodness to us. Every good thing. Sometimes we look at this world and we struggle. God, look at this COVID. Look at this pandemic. Look at how much our children are suffering with online learning. But then I think, God, even in the midst of this pandemic, I'm still alive. God, even in the midst of this pandemic, my children have online learning. They're still learning. They're still alive. So every good thing that you experience in your life, it is God's glory in your life. If you're depressed, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling lonely right now, can I just encourage you? Can I remind you? God's still good. God is doing some incredible things in your life. No, it's not the end of the world for you. No, God is doing some beautiful things in your life. If you will just let your hands partner with him. I have a five-year-old child. I, uh, I have to hold her hands when I cross the street. When I cross the street, I don't hold her hands like this. Because I know she can twist her arms away from me. I hold her arms like this. I know that she cannot let go that easily when I hold her hands like this. He is holding you. He is upholding you. That's what the word says there. The next section says he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. He sustains everything. My dear child of God, my time is coming to an end. But he is holding your hands. He is sustaining you. There's nothing that you need to be discouraged about. Open up your mouth and talk to the Lord and say, God, I struggle with this. But Jesus, I draw close to you. You are my high priest. You are my savior. God, you sent your son into this world to show off your son. And you're reminding me, God, you have cleansed me from my sins. You have cleansed me. I love that word, cleansed, cleansed. Another translation says purged. That doesn't mean it vanishes. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist anymore. It's invisible. It means Jesus has done an incredible work to cleanse and purge the sins out of your life. Today, my friend, you have new hope. You have new joy. You have new peace in your life. When you open your eyes up, you have new vision, new glory. Why? Because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is alive and well. Brothers and sisters, my time is up, but I want to close with a word of prayer if I, if I may. I want to just thank you, thank you, thank you for being attentive to the word of God. God, I thank you in the fullness of time, in your wisdom, in your brilliance, you sent your son Jesus to this earth. He came to this earth 2,000 years ago. 
today, I can't see Jesus. Sometimes I don't feel Jesus. I want to feel his touch on my life. I want him to touch me, but sometimes I don't feel his touch. But God, that doesn't mean Jesus doesn't exist. And then you're seated at the right hand of the Father. He says, anyone who accepts him, he is knocking at your door right now. If any person accepts him, receives him, he will come in and he will fellowship with you. Jesus, we have heard your door, knock, you, knock, you knocking on our doors. We open our doors up. We welcome you in, into my life, Lord. I humble myself for you to walk into my life. I surrender so that you can increase and I can decrease. I welcome you into my church, Lord. I welcome you into my family, God. I welcome you into my children's life, Lord. Come in, Holy Spirit, and fellowship with me. Jesus, make yourself real in my life. Father, I bless every single brother and sister on this line right now. May they feel the reality of the Son, Jesus, in their life. Give them visions and dreams tonight. May they hear your voice clearly. I bless your children. May they walk in your glory, God. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen.